kindly save this live. I hope I can. Like, I, I don't really know how this works. I thought it would just be so easy and straightforward, but apparently it's not. And I'm very, very sorry about that. Um, yeah, we're just going to jump right into it immediately because I want that if other people come to watch this, like much, much um, later, they don't see all those lags and lapses of people just say, hi, hi, hi. I want them to just like get right into it. At least that's what like I like. Um, Someone says, um, first time I'm joining your live. Hi, oh, you're welcome. I usually have my lives on Instagram. But Instagram can be distracting, so here we are. Okay, so we are actually going to start with prayer. I hope everyone has brought their Bibles and maybe journals and they are ready to, you know, start this is the gorgeous Esther. Hey, Esther Ide. This is a rabbi in our midst, so it is an honor <laughs> and a privilege. I feel like this is so weird. I don't know if you guys can actually hear me. We're just going to jump right in. So, I'm just going to start with prayer. Um, Spirit of the Living God, we just honor you and we welcome you. I thank you for all these beautiful souls that you have drawn to this teaching and to this class today. I thank you for the sacrifice of their time. They could have been doing so many other things right now, but they have chosen to um, learn more about you, to draw closer to you. It is, it is in the indicative of the desires of their heart. And I just pray that you honor that desire. I pray that Esther and I will not speak of ourselves but I will speak only what you want us to speak, that the words we will say will bring life, will bring clarity, direction, and that you would help us know how to save this Instagram life so that other people, this YouTube life, so that other people have access to it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. 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 So pumped. I'm so excited. Um. Yeah, I, I hope you guys can see us clearly. Please let me know if you can see us clearly. So Esther, do you want to introduce yourself? I thought you were going first. Yeah, you go first. <laughs> cool. Hi, my name is, hello, my name is Esther Ide. Um, I am a disciple of Jesus. Cheese! <laughs> <laughs> I'm a disciple of Jesus. Um, yeah, I think I think is there anything else I can talk about? Ah, uh, yeah, you're a married woman. Give us the yes, I'm married to the love of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, we got married last year, December. I I so much love it. Yeah, I love it too. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Esther is an actual rabbi. Like she's a teacher of the word of God. Um, if you've heard Esther speak before, you know she's a phenomenal person. And I'm not just saying this because she's here, but I truly honor the gift of God that is in her and the presence of God in her. Um, this session we're having was just such a random theme where I was literally just like, I love reading the Bible, but I haven't always loved reading the Bible. <laughs> and so, I, like, as I started reading the Bible, let me just quickly say, I know that me and Esther have, like, differing views on this, <laughs> but I decided to read the Bible in a year, <laughs> this year. And one of the main reasons for me, I'm going to, like, rush ahead really, really fast and say a lot of things, but, like, I, I knew that I have never intentionally in my life tried to cram scripture before. Like really say that, oh, I'm going to cram this particular verse. I think it was only a particular verse in Titus that I ever decided to cram. Every other scripture that I know, I just read it. And then I just saw that when I needed it, God would just remind me. Like it, it, obviously now I know that it's God, mm -hmm. but then I didn't know it was God that would just bring those things up. So I might not know the exact verses like, oh, Genesis chapter one, verse this says this, that, that, that. But I would say, oh, scripture says this, scripture says that. And I will remember those things and that was what Jesus said of the Holy Spirit, that he will remind you of everything that Jesus has said. And so for me, I just see it as my duty to read mm -hmm. and God's duty to remind me. <laughs> That's how I just honestly see it. So for me, I feel like in all my years of being a 
Christian, I've had those times where I'm like, oh, I'm going to read this, you know, particular book. Can I read it and this particular book? Well, I'm just like, I've been a Christian for like five years and I've never read the entire Bible. I know it's not like a, you know, contest or something, but I'm like, I can't be teaching people scripture if I've not at least gotten it into my system. I don't know if you get what I'm saying. Yeah, so I'm just like, okay, you know what? This year, I want to get all of that scripture into my system first. And then I can now start taking it apart. Like I can also take Genesis. I want to focus on Genesis for a whole year if I want to. At least I know that I know what, you know, Chronicle says or what, you know, Ezra says and just all of this scripture. So that is the reason why I decided to read the Bible in a year. And I know that people have different views about that, but this is just mine. And that's why I to quickly put that out. So obviously, as I'm reading the Bible, I'm seeing things that I've never known before like this is crazy like i'm reading about david and he's like mighty men mm. and i'm like is this not tall mm. like is this not like all these like superhero so. characters that they are creating like david being left with i think he was um abishai i don't know which mm. of his men and only both of them defeated how many men and i'm reading this thing and i'm like mind blown right and i'm like telling you know Isimeme about it gushing about it like oh my goodness it's amazing how could they have done this how could i done that like just so many things and i was like you know what i i want to share this with other people as well i want them to be able to learn scripture love reading it enjoy and enjoy reading it and as I was thinking, like, okay, God, how do I go about this? Esther came to mind. Like, you know, Isi um, mentioned her and was like, oh, Esther is a wonderful, like, teacher of, you know, scripture. If there's one person you want to do this with, it's Esther. Mm-hmm. And, so, <laughs> and Esther has this Bible study group. I think I've linked them in the description box below. They're actually a community. They study the scripture together. They go over it. So if you're interested in that, you know, he's your go-to person. So yeah, so my name is Izini Zara. Um, I am also a wife. <laughs> I am 25 years old. What else is there about me? Nothing much really. I'm just a regular everyday girl with a you know, touch of anointing. <laughs> Influencer for Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, so that's Izini and that's Esther. And that's the reason why we are having this, you know, live. Okay, so I guess after that, I wanted to just briefly mention what the bible is so mm. i think i will have you answer that esther what is the bible isn't it <laughs> okay um i would say that the bible is something that is first of all there's like the basic definition of what the bible is is an anthology of other what writings. does anthology mean? an anthology is like a, it's a literary term for a collection of works that have been written by so many authors that mm-hmm. have the same mind frame of mindset so the bible is a documentation of these people's experience with god and how they've journeyed with god to see who he is and to understand his mind and his heart for all of mankind so um it's really it's really one of the reasons the bible is described as the hyperlinked text mm-hmm. the hyperlink being that one text is going to lead you to another te- um, text that's going to lead you to another, another text. And then the more you explore the book, the more you start to see that these people experienced a similar God. They experienced yes. one God. One God. You know, that was um, that was experienced in individual ways, but at the same time still brought about a collective um, understanding of who he is and what he wants to do with mankind yeah so that's like a fundamental definition yeah i think for me what really like made me just like so excited when i was reading scripture was the Mm -hmm. fact that i could see that god really cared about each person that Mm -hmm. i'm reading about even if he was speaking about israel as a whole god cared about each person and it's just seeing how god cared about people from one from one generation to the other to the other it's like this is the same god that loved Abraham that is loving David, that is loving me. And so for me, it was just when I'm reading the words of God in scripture to Abraham or to David, I'm like, wow, this is something God could be saying to me. You know, so I feel like that was just it for me, you know, because I I I had this, okay, let me just talk about my own, you know, background with the Bible and everything. Growing up, I had this idea of God that God was someone who was very strict. He was very just waiting for you to mess up and he would just like press you and throw you in hell like you know i also didn't see god as someone who really cared about me or someone who loved me i've said this before that i thought i was 
human one billion and fifty five. And so God was just like, even if isn't it doesn't work, I have like bigger people that I really care about that really matter to me. And for me, like every time I try to, I remember even one time when I was like, you know, thirteen, mm. I heard God speak to me, even though I didn't know it was God then. Mm. God basically spoke to me and said, oh, I want us to be closer than we are. Like, I want us to, you know. And I remember just laughing and just telling God, like, but that's not possible now. Because, mm. like, I have, like, I, I actually have, like, an active social life. I have things that I'm doing. Like, this is not the days of, like, the, you know, Israelites. Like, they didn't have anything doing. They just, mm. just go to the farm and just come back and pray. So, as you know, as many I didn't have anything doing, of course, me and you will be every day, you know. And I can just imagine how insulting. <laughs> <laughs> how insulting that must have been been to god like mm. it's like who the heck do you think you are let's, <laughs> let's, let's even start there but i felt like i was just like too busy for god and when i would start like when i first like when i gave my life to christ i was 17 i was about to turn 18 i started trying to read the bible for me it was something to just tick off my list mm. of things to do i didn't even have like a personal bible study time it was just like this open heavens, nothing mm. wrong with open heavens, by the way. Open heavens, it will say the scripture for today is let's say Job chapter 2, verse 1 to 2. Mm. And I'll read that scripture and I'll say, Oh wow, I read my Bible today. Mm. You know, and I'm like, Oh, I've, I've done something spiritual. Tick. That's a good thing, you know. Mm. I guess that's that's a place to start. It's not a place to remain, I guess. Mm. You know, so I was just like, oh yeah. So for me, reading the Bible was always just something to take off. So I didn't do it a lot and I didn't do it on like a regular basis. It was very, very boring, especially since again, background was in the you know catholic church they would just read like portions of like you know scripture and it was always boring and i was just like especially epistles i never really understood those things i was just like yeah they, they, because they would only pick like a small passage like two or three passages i read in church and that would just be it and i'll just be like gosh this paul was so boring like well, why are we even who cares about these things he's talking about mm. you know and another thing it felt like as if the bible was locked sure it felt like I couldn't open it to see what these people are talking about. So when people say, oh, I've read this thing, I'm like, I read this and I don't see it. You know, that, that, that kind of thing. So I felt like it was locked. So for a long time, reading the Bible was just not something that I wanted to do. Until I got to a point where I genuinely started wanting to know God. Like I just wanted to know him. And I would pray and I would say, God, tell me who you are. How do you think? How do you talk? Like, what do you like? What um, don't you like? And the Holy Spirit was guiding me to scripture. Like, if I want to know about God, start here. Yeah. You know, at the end of the day, scripture is is intended to lead us into our own experience of Absolutely. God. You know, so for me, starting to read scripture started helping me to know God. Mm. But I want to hear your own background. Right, by the because you didn't come out of your mother's room, a rabbi. Maybe I did. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to hear um, your own. Just off the top of my head, something that you said that is quite interesting. When people tend to be afraid of the Bible. Mm. Um, you know, they will, there's like a form of rebellion in man mm. that scares us from the truth of what the Bible says. Mm. Um, but something very intriguing about it is that things are not, the Bible doesn't write things or things are not true because the Bible says it. Mm. The Bible says it because they are true. Mm. And so that means that like the Bible is, it, it covers like the fundamental principles of life. Mm. And so in order for you to be able to understand how the, how the world works, because if you go through like the things that are written in scriptures and you compare them with scientific facts, mm -hmm. they are not so far from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, you start to see like, this is really an intelligent book. It's mm -hmm. not just like a religious- Or just you like know. a you know, collection of stories that yes. like people call it. Yeah, you know, it's it's a it's really an intelligent book, you know, and, and that's I think that's kind of one of the things that started to intrigue me about like Bible and Bible studies. I think for me it was more it first started off as an intellectual quest, if I'm going to be honest. Mm -hmm. Um my grandfather, when I was in primary school, um, I found a book by my, my my a Bible that my grandfather had. It was an apocryphal Bible. Okay. Um, so an apocryphal Bible is Bible is a Bible that has like the books that are known canonical. Oh, that's a Catholic Bible. Yes. Mm -hmm. So like you know, um, in this Bible they have like books like Maccabees, mm -hmm. you know, Tobit, you mm -hmm. know. Tobit. Yeah. I, I found those things very very interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, so I used to be like. Um, 
I would read like Maccabees and I'll be like, this is just so intriguing, like the the books of wisdom. And I'm like, this yeah, is just, it was so, mm -hmm. you know, I found it very interesting. Bell, like, always, Bell and Dragon. Yes, Bell and the Dragon that was from the book of Daniel. Yeah. You know, it was, yeah, it was just a whole lot. Um, so I found it very interesting, even though I was really young. Um, I think one of the things that even drew me to that was a book that my mom bought for me, a Bible book that she bought for me. So it had like a lot of pictures and graphics, you know. I just found some of the stories interesting, especially the story of Noah. Mm. So when I found my grandfather's Bible, even if I didn't understand so many things I was reading there, I just thought that the people that wrote the book were more intelligent than my teachers. Mm. You know, so I was like, I find this very, very interesting. I love the thought. Um, and then I started reading the book of Revelations. Mm. I feel like it was, <laughs> I feel like it was a trap. You know, so I went to the book of Revelations, just me being confused about, number one, why pastors are not really talking about these books mm. in church. Mm. It just felt like everybody just stuck with maybe the book of Matthew, Matthew or Mark, the book of Mark, yeah. you know, and I'm like, there's mm -hmm. just, there's so mm -hmm. many books in the Bible mm -hmm. that nobody's talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started reading the book of Revelation, that's when I, I, it felt like I hit like a, a, a wall mm. and I started asking existential questions like <laughs> like who is God mm -hmm. where did God come from mm -hmm. and I started asking these questions and I would get so frustrated because nobody was giving me mm -hmm. answers and everybody was asking me not to say anything like mm -hmm. don't ask God don't like, question God where does it come from because I really was afraid and mm -hmm. I was like why are we asked to serve a God that we don't even know where he came from? Like, where did he come from? Like, yeah. how did you form the world? And not, like, number two, like, you did not ask me if I wanted to be on this earth. Like, I you know, know. Know. It's like always <laughs> that. You didn't ask me if I wanted to be here. Now you're writing in Revelation that there'll be rapture, there'll be years of suffering, there'll be mark of the beast. Though, and you know, like, like then the theology was they'll cut off your hand. They'll write. Oh my God! I used to have dreams that like rapture will come and then I won't make it. They'll be like this long staircase and I'll be running to it before I get to it. Just, then they'll not say, "Are you for God or for the devil?" You not say i'm for god you'll not cut off your ear like it's like i used to have the worst dreams <laughs> growing up and then when i read that like left left behind left me. Me. oh my god scan <laughs> it was so scared so i feel like i still have like trauma from it. of course yeah. i don't think there's anybody that's gone through like that whole theology that does not that's not yeah. really traumatized by it but i yeah. used to have that like i used to be so frustrated very miserable then i stopped reading those parts of the bible then I started reading like the small Bible, like very small ones. But I think like my journey of like scriptures as from like a very um, early age, mm -hmm. I just found it very, I found it more intellectually stimulating. Mm -hmm. So I found like adults talking about it in church, mm -hmm. you know, Bible studies. I love Bible studies because I just felt, I just felt like this has to be an intelligent being mm -hmm. somewhere, you know, and I found it intriguing. I feel like God used a part of um, myself to pull me to himself. Mm. And that's the fact that I've always been very intrigued with research mm. and asking questions and all of that. So, you know, he started to pull me closer to himself. And then as time went on, I now started to realize that it's one thing to no scriptures it's another thing for the scriptures to mix with blood in you mm -hmm. and that you now start to live the life you know that is in, in, the, in that world so it, sure. it was like intellectual at some point but then later i started to realize that oh my god this is life you know this is literally life and then psalms 119 started to make so much sense to me when david would speak about your word refreshing my soul like you know, and, and it just it just became such a beautiful um, experience for me. So I don't know if there was ever a time that I thought that um, the Bible was boring. I think what I had more was questions that made me um, not really doubt, but I just really wanted to understand the mind and the um, the evidence that this was true. You know, so what makes it true? Why is it the truth? And if it is the truth, then why are we so fixated on utilizing it as a weapon yeah. as opposed to you know a teaching guide people. or teaching people how to to understand it? So yeah, for sure. So do you want to tell us how you got to a point where you decided that 
this Bible is true? Because you said I just wanted to be sure that it was mm. true. Yeah. So how did you know that the Bible is true? Because right now we're having lots of people who are saying, oh, the, the Bible is not true. It was written by a bunch of people, mm. all those things. How, which is funny enough, like going back to what I said, you know, things are not written in the Bible because it is, um, the things are not said, or the Bible doesn't write things because... Or we don't say things that are written in the Bible because it is true, or the Bible doesn't make it true. The Bible writes it because it is true. And what I mean by that is that the world as it is, is governed by principles. Mm -hmm. So for example, everything has cause and effect, effect, you know? So number one, like if I steal someone's property, um, God doesn't need to tell me that you should not steal without me experiencing the effects or the impact of stealing. Mm -hmm. You know, I might, not, I might not be affected by it now, mm -hmm. but I will be affected by it because the way the world is, and which is actually how I started to understand it, the way the world is, the world is made to cleanse itself of mm -hmm. what is not good for it. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so and the same way your body is. I if you take something, <laughs> you know, if mm -hmm. you take something that is not good for your body, your body will find a way to, push it out, yeah. you know, and that process of like um, effect or consequence is what we tend to speak of or describe as the um, the fruit of sin. Mm -hmm. Like James was saying that after sin comes to its fullness, it leads to death. What that death is literally is an eradication of what is not good or mm -hmm. what is not essential, you know. Um, and so I said to see that the way God's mind, God's mind works is higher than the way man's mind works. But if you allow him to teach you how his mind works, you start to realize that God is not a madman. And like there are so many things that he says that when you actually really think about it, you would actually be like, makes a whole lot of sense. Yeah. You know, like I get For what sure. you're trying to say, sure. you know, and if I go through like Abraham's experience as well, and I see the things that Abraham was journeying with God. So, for example, the way we like to say that Abraham was circumcised to, to seal the covenants with God, it wasn't so. Abraham was willing to take undergo circumcision because he believed that God was true. So his circumcision was a fruit of his faith, mm. not a sealing of his faith. Mm. He didn't do it because he wanted to have faith. He did it because he yeah. had faith, you know? And so I started to see that all these people that were writing, Moses as well, like Moses was willing to go up the mountain because he had seen something that was beyond the ordinary. And I feel like he had such an inquisitive mind because he was not being so compelled to know what is in that darkness that everybody's running away from. If you're running away from darkness, guess what? I want to go to that darkness to see what is there. You know, even the conversations that, he had with God when God said, I'm going to destroy the Israelites. Um, when I read it and I went back to what Job was saying, I didn't see like the difference between Job's mind and Moses' mind because Moses technically rebuked God and said, God forbid, I'm not going to do this thing with you. You can't bring these people out from Egypt and then kill them in the desert. You know, and then people will say, oh, is this why you brought them here? You brought them to kill them. And I was wondering, like, what would have given somebody this kind of audacity. audacity to have this kind of conversation with God? But then I realized that Moses didn't just see God as, again, a madman that was, if he saw God as a reasonable being, somebody that he was able to reason with. with, you know, someone that was wise and was able to make you wise by mm, fellowship by and association. Being. Exactly, you know. And then just also looking at how Abraham was able to do the same thing that Moses did, the same thing that Job did. For sure. You know, all of these people were able to speak with God as they would to a friend, you know, even if he was mighty and even if he is mighty and, you know, all of that, God is also willing to take us through this journey where we're able to reason with him as one would with a friend. Mm -hmm. So the more I started to read these people's stories and scriptures, I started to see like friendship, you know, that was real mm -hmm. and it was organic and it's so rare in the times that we live in now. And I remember which is actually the first time that I got to encounter the tangibility of the Holy Spirit because I had read the Bible, you know, but I just didn't really, again, I didn't feel that life. And so one day I had finished reading like a book, and I got on my knees and I said, Holy Spirit, if you're real, I want to be your friend. And I just said it in my room. And that day, like, it was it was as though, like, I still remember the song he gave to me. I still remember, like, the experience that I felt. 
And it just all, just brought me back to this thing where I was like, oh my God, God is real. This Bible is real. These stories are real. This friendship is real. These people, these people are real. Yeah. You know, and if I want to really know for myself, I just need to ask to experience what they experience. And honestly, even if I ask um, and I don't experience it, I don't really have anything to lose. I could, I just got to that point where I'm like, what do I have to lose? I don't have anything to lose. If I if I don't experience it, I'm not losing anything. If I experience it, all the best, I'm even gaining. So it was that um, idea that the Lord gave me, the wisdom that he gave me to start asking, is this thing real? I want to experience it. And that's how I still read the Bible till today. If I'm reading mm -hmm. like a person's experience, I'm asking God, is Same. this real? You know, I want Same. to experience it. Is this real i want it you know um and and that actually started to bring the bible to life um for me yeah. i would say like when when like and this is what i'm drawing from your story which is also similar to mine mm. is that what changes everything when it comes to reading the bible is your motive yes like so we, we were even talking about this before this class as to why some some people will say or when I start reading the Bible, I sleep off. Yeah. So you are sleeping off because you don't have the right motive yeah. for reading the Bible. For instance, there are people that I talk to that when they are talking to me, I am sleeping off because I really don't care what they are saying. Like, it's just fact. So they might be saying something and I'm just like, oh God, when will they say it? Please, I'm feeling so sleepy and I'm just trying not to sleep off because yeah. it's your body saying, we are not interested in mm. what is going on. Yeah. We'd rather just shut down until something exciting is happening. Mm. So I feel like the same thing applies to anything, whether you're talking to someone, listening to a lecture, or reading the Bible. Mm. If you don't want to be there, your body knows you don't want to be there. Yeah. And it immediately just shut down and yeah. just be like, yeah, we don't want to you know, do this anymore. So I know that when I was really struggling to read the Bible, when it looked locked to me, mm. was when I just wanted to read it so that I could be scholarly, mm. so that I could be like, oh, I have read it, you know, today. But the moment I came with my heart mm. and I said, this God, there's something about him in this Bible. Like there's something in this Bible that can make me know more about him. So a lot of people teach about the Bible differently. Esther, you are a rabbi. You can rein me in if I start going too far. But basically, I don't believe that the Bible, like, I don't believe that when we read scripture and we read about all these wonderful men and women of faith, we're meant to be like, oh, look how wonderful God was and close our Bible and leave it there. Like Esther said, I've always believed that if God could do this for Peter, I mean, Am I not a person? Am I not a human being? Am I not a person? Like, that has always just been it for me. And I remember, like, when I prayed the same prayer, which was, God, I don't know if you are real. I'm about to start this, my Christian journey, and I just need to know that you're out there because I don't want to waste my time pursuing a God. And this is just, I'm just very honest with God. I don't want to waste my time pursuing a God that is not real, only to get to the end of my life and discover that there's nothing after life, mm -hmm. right? Because that was Satan was telling me that, oh, you're just wasting your time. You could be partying. You could be with boys. Because that was my only problem that mm. time. Who would like me? Who would date me? Like, that was my problem. <laughs> so that was what the enemy was, you know, putting to me. And I just prayed. And I said, God, if you're out there, I want to know. Mm. And that was the first time I had an encounter where I saw God. Mm. And it was so real that when I, when I woke up, this world was not even as real as that mm. world. It was more like this one was like filmy, like almost like a dream, while the one I was coming from was the real one. Mm. And had so many more after that that just reinforced that this God is real. But no matter how much I read about Justin Bieber online, mm. oh, Justin Bieber has a wife, he's 20 something years old, or oh, Nathaniel Bassi is 30, he's 40, sorry, he has a wife, he has children. It can never really reveal who Nathaniel Bassi is as a person to me. I can only know of him. So I feel like that's what scripture does. Like scripture mm. lets us know things about God and know things of God. Mm. But it doesn't really foster the intimacy. Mm. It's almost like, okay, based on what I've read in scripture, I now know how I can relate with God. I now know how I can now approach him. I now know what I can say to him 
when I read Psalms, David is teaching me honesty. Like when I say David is teaching me honesty, like I just started reading Psalms. I've gotten to the book of Psalms and I'm reading things and I'm just like, whoa. Mm. I just realized that I've never been this honest to God. Mm. And this is what scripture can do for you. It doesn't necessarily mean that you read it and be like, ah, I'm tracing this scripture to Ezekiel, tracing it to, that is great. But there are also instances where it starts to judge your motives, judge your actions, judge the way you are living, judge the way you even relate mm. with God. So for me, I started to see that I still hide. There are still times when I feel like, no, God wants a child that is strong mm. and someone that will come and say, my father, even though the storms are raging, I believe in you. And I'm seeing David just there like, where are you? I'm surrounded by my enemies. They want mm. to kill me. They want because we have this Christian culture. Of, Don't confess negative with your mouth. <laughs> Don't confess negative with your mouth. So even when you are like dying, you are like still saying, I'm alive. <laughs> I'm alive. And your angel is just like, are you dying? Are you alive? Like, how, how do I come through? Do I have <laughs> how do I come through? So, like, I'm seeing, the, like, even when I'm reading this, song, because you, Esther, taught me to read the Bible out, out loud. Mm. Since we had a conversation, I started reading it out loud. I really started to see that it changes everything, mm. really, reading it out loud. Because I was reading Psalm 27 yesterday night, and because there's something that is happening that was making me scared, like, a, you know, something God has asked me to do. And I was afraid, but I didn't know that I was scared. And I said, I'm reading Psalm 27, and it says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Mm. Why should I be afraid? Mm. Maybe I read it, I started crying. Mm. Because I just it just hits into my heart that, isn't it why you're afraid? If mm. you truly say you trust God, if you are truly following him, why are you afraid? Like, you just judge that fear immediately. Mm. And I feel like that is something else that, you know, scripture does. So instead of running to your friends, like, looking for who can give you a word. Of course, we need people. I'm not saying we don't need yeah. people. But there are times when you are, when, when, when there are things inside your heart that only God knows. Mm. And in that moment, scripture judges it. Like, this is fear, and we're going to judge fear immediately. This mm. is, you know, worry. We're going to judge, judge, you know, worry immediately. So for me, that was just, I can't even explain what happened. Like, I just even put the Bible down and cried for a good how many minutes. I just kept on repeating that scripture to myself mm. and saying, why should I be afraid? Like, that was a question to ask here. Mm. And that just, you know, broke that thing over me. So for me, when I come to the Bible, I'm looking for God in mm. this Bible. I'm looking at how did he talk to Abraham when he did something wrong? How, how will God speak to me when I do something wrong? That also now tailors your heart to know when the enemy comes to say, you've done this, to know that, no, God won't speak to me like this. He will actually correct me, but he won't do it in a way that I'm crippled and I can't get up anymore, you know? Just so many instances, I could go on and on, and I'll read a few scriptures later. And, and you know, Esther can share some if she has some. Mm. But basically, for me, this is the reason why I go to the Bible and why I can't sleep off. Because mm. as I'm reading about these people, I'm seeing myself mm. in it. As I'm reading about Joshua going to fight giants, mm. seeing that God has already put the fear of Joshua in those people. Mm knowing that there is nothing God will send me to do that. He hasn't already gone ahead to make sure that I have the victory. It just immediately just gives this, you know, con confidence where we are able to get up and say, I can do this. Mm -hmm. So when a lot of people see the things that I do and they say, oh my goodness, how are you doing this? is a backing of the knowledge of the character of God. Mm -hmm. And that knowledge of God's character came through scripture. And through now saying, okay, God, if you did it for this person, I expect to see it in my own life. Mm. And so for me, it's like just never ending levels of knowing God. Mm. That's just why I read scripture and like why I can't sleep off. Mm. Why I mean, because I actually care. Yeah. So why do you think people sleep off when they are reading the Bible? I mean, there are so many reasons. You could be tired. <laughs> you could be uninterested. Um, oh, okay. So... Maybe I should speak about like some of the approaches that people mm -hmm. take when they read the Bible. So there are like three things that people can look at when you're reading the Bible. Um, number one, sometimes people read the Bible like it's a museum. They treat it like <laughs> they treat it like it's they a are museum. relics. You yeah. know? <laughs> you know, so uh, I wanted to talk about you know history. Let me mm -hmm. go and look for you know some historical things that happen, like oh with David and Goliath. You know, let's go and read what really really happened. 
Like if you treat the Bible like a museum, at some point you're going to get bored um, and you'll get tired of it. Um, some people treat the Bible like a gym. So it's like, oh, I only go there to get like moral, you know, codes and oh, let me read the book of Proverbs, you know, let me know, let me learn how to not argue with a fool. <laughs> you know, it's like, um, oh, he that argues with a fool is a fool. Um, a living dog is better than a dead lion. You know, like all of these things that we see. Um, oh, wow, I haven't gotten to Proverbs. In the book of, I don't even know um, Proverbs. Yeah. It's like, in the book of Proverbs, Proverbs is very beautiful, but it's also very, you know, very interesting. Um, and then finally, people treat the Bible like a desert. So they go there when they are dry mm. and you want to drink. Mm. Um, so, you know, like all these occasional things, like you can go to the Bible when you want to get moral codes or you go to the Bible when you are thirsty or you go to the Bible when you want to visit like historical facts or historical, um, you know, narratives or all of that stuff. If, if, you, if that is your approach to the Bible, of course you're going to sleep. At some point, you're going to feel sleepy, you're going to feel bored, you're going to feel tired. Um, you know, you're going to feel all of these things. Um, so, yeah, one of the major things that Jesus teaches his disciples and teaches us on how to read the Bible is to go through scriptures looking for God, like you said, looking for Christ and looking for the narrative of 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 God's heart, you know, for, uh, yes. for all of mankind. God's heart. Um, when he was speaking to them, um, I don't know if you remember in the book of John, um, when he resurrected from, you know, from the grave, and then he was walking on the road to um, Emmaus, and then some of his disciples were on the road. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the, I really love that scripture because it says that the Lord um, there was a veil that was put over them. So they did not even know who was speaking to them, right? And then Jesus, they encountered Jesus. Jesus took them to a room. And then when he got to the room, he was talking to them. He broke bread with them, you know, and then he started talking about the scriptures. Jesus spoke about the books of the prophets, the books of the writings, you know, and he spoke about the books of Moses, which is the first five books, the books of the prophets. You have all the prophetic books and then the writings, mm -hmm. Psalms, Proverbs, you know, and all the historical books that was written. Jesus speaks to them about all of these things. And then when he breaks bread, and gave it to them, he disappeared. And then when he disappeared, scripture says that the Lord lifted the veil from their eyes. And when the veil was lifted, they said, didn't our heart burn when he spoke to us? Mm -hmm. And so he was speaking to them about how to look at scriptures. Don't look at it like you're just um, reading some books or you're just reading some articles somewhere. It's so random. I, I really want to say this. It really breaks my heart when I see like, people show so much disrespect to, you know, to what the Bible is about. Um, I've heard so many people say things like, oh, the Bible is not the word of God. The Bible contains the word of God. All of that stuff, it sounds nice, but I think it would be nicer if you that you're saying the Bible is not the word of God actually have an understanding of what the Bible is about. But when we don't even want to know what the Bible is about, and then you start saying things like the Bible is not the word of God, or the Bible is not the this of God, or the Bible is not the that of God, you now start finding yourself in places and in moments where you only go to the Bible to do researches. You don't have any respect for it. You don't have any regard for it. And in often case, that's what you're saying, that feeling of feeling like the Bible has been locked because if I'm going to be honest, the Bible is a being. The Bible yeah. has a mind. The Bible yeah. thinks. You know, if you read the Bible very closely, you see that there is a way the Bible thinks. You will see the thoughts being unraveled as you go through scriptures. Like if you're going through Genesis chapter one and then you're going through um, John chapter one, you now start to realize that, oh my God, this is like the same thought pattern that is sprinkled throughout scriptures. The Bible really thinks. And then when you come to the Bible, I like, treat it like something that is so random and it's just, you know, oh, let me just put it under my pillow when I want to go to bed. So which is not yeah. at night. Oh, you don't know that. Yeah. People that put it under their That's pillows. <laughs> oh, people that put it under their pillows when they go to That's bed. That's like a locket. Or yeah, like, you know, oh, you know, just put it under the Bible when they go to 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 put it under the pillow when they go to bed or they only use it when they feel like they've been attacked by demons at night. You know, all of these random things that we use the Bible for, these are things that they, it's a, they are fruit of the disrespect or the disregard or the lack of understanding that we have for what it is about. So when your disposition already is in that place where this is a tool or this is a weapon or this is, you know, an occasional 
book that I'm going to look at or read or, you know, all of that, um, there's a very high tendency that you go to it and you will not receive what it has to give to you. But if, like you were saying, the, your disposition is, how can I find God and how can I learn about God? You know, how can I know what his heart is about? Oh, what heart. is his plan for me? What is his plan for oh, creation? God. You know, when that is your disposition, even when you come to scriptures and you are feeling sleepy or you're feeling tired, your motive is going to be the driving force that will keep you coming back, regardless of how much you're struggling with it. There's something that the Lord said to me that really, really, really forms my mind even up until today. Um, he said there is only a student when there is a teacher. Mm. I'm sorry, there's only a teacher when there is a student. Mm. The Holy Spirit is described as a teacher, but a teacher is never going to force himself on you. You will experience several dimensions of the Holy Spirit depending on what you demand or the demand that you place on him. For example, we are friends, but there are certain dimensions of yourself that I cannot experience until I place a demand yeah. on you to give me those things. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is that kind of teacher. He's a teacher to who wants to be a student. And it's funny that, you know, it's only for some, I wouldn't say in only Christianity, but for some reason it's like, it's only in people that share the faith that we share that we hear things like, I stopped reading the Bible because it was too complicated for me. Of course, it's going to be complicated for you when you're starting out. It's not going to be the easiest thing for you. Your body is not even used to building these kinds of discipline. So what you have to do is the same way when you go to school or university in your first year, you don't pack up your bags and say, I'm leaving because I don't understand anything anybody's teaching me. You keep showing up. You keep making a, a demand on the teacher. You keep saying, every single time I come, I'm always tired and I really need you to help me. I need you to be, you know, I need you to be vulnerable with me. I need you to guide me through these things. These things are complicated. I don't understand what Paul is saying. I don't understand what anybody is saying in this place, you know, but I really want to trust you that as my teacher, you will teach me and you will guide me and you will help me understand. I have never met anybody that just said, oh, I just opened the Bible one day and all of a sudden I just had understanding of everything. God doesn't work that way. The system of God is to humble the heart of man. So if it's not to humble you, you will just open the Bible and just say, ah, is it not this simple thing? Let me just read it. I will get it. But God has designed it in such a way that you have the need for it. You recognize the need for it. And you keep coming back because you know that you need it. So feeling sleepy might not even be the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem is what you do when you're sleepy. Do you keep showing up? Do you wake up and start again? Because it's possible you can read and sleep, up, but what do you do when you read and sleep? Up? Do you wake up and say, okay, let me try again? Or do you just close the Bible and say, man, it's not working out? You know, So it's the hard posture and what exactly you're looking for that the Bible responds to. And oftentimes when you come to the Bible with a heart that is vulnerable and genuine, it starts to open up to you like a yeah, friend. Yeah, definitely, you know, for sure. Open. I know that for me, one thing that really changed everything was the moment I just decided that I really wanted to know God mm. and I really wanted to read this Bible and I really wanted to know how people interacted with him. Mm. I wanted to really know his heart. And I know that the minute I got to that point and I just came with my heart, it was like the book just opened and mm. just... I started to see so many things. I guess the most, re, the strongest message I've gotten from scripture as a whole mm. is that God's plan has always been to save us. Mm. You know, he, he, his plan has never been to abandon us, to leave us. It's really just one of love. God is very firm, very just, very yeah. judge. But I just see how where it's just like, if you even so much as turn to him in sincerity and just say, God have mercy on me. It's almost like before you finish saying have mercy, he's already running to, and I'm just like, whoa. Because I remember I was reading about Ahab mm -hmm. and Ahab had done all sorts of dis despicable things, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, what do what they call it? Had done all sort of like nonsense things, basically. Sorry, hold on. Let me just move that so I can focus. Yeah. <laughs> Did all sort of despicable things, right? And then, um, what you might call it? Um, God was angry with him mm -hmm. and was going to kill him, and sent a 
prophet to tell him that you have done all of these evil things. I've watched you and your wife, but you are going to die now. Mm. And Ahab put on sackcloth. He sat on the floor. He was crying. Like Ahab has done these speakable things mm -hmm. that he don't even get. But because of how he humbled himself, I mean, a whole king mm -hmm. putting on sackcloth, sitting on the crown, ground and crying, God said, Ah, look at how he have as humble. I couldn't even believe when I when I when I when I was because it was like as if I was inside of, inside mm. like a like a drama mm. play. So when I was just reading it like yes, justice, yes, this man has done mm. evil. I then I started seeing God say, Ah, look at how he have as humbled himself before me. I had to put it down. I was like, <laughs> Am I? Are we God? Are you not seeing what is happening? Like, mm. how can you be pitying this person that killed so many people? Like, but God was like, Oh, look at how he have as humbled himself. Because mm. of this, I will not bring this judgment in his lifetime. Mm. Because God knows that hey, if you don't mess up, it's your children that will mm. mess up. Somebody must mess up. And somebody must collect yeah. for this thing. And truly, his children messed up. And mm. they were the ones who now received the judgment, mm. basically. So for me, it was just saying that, wow. So even somebody that is so evil, God can show that person mercy. For mm. me, that was just like, wow. Mm. You know, just really seeing God's heart. And just seeing how much he loves us. Mm. And just... How much he wants to draw us mm. to us uh, to himself mm. yeah okay so i want to ask you a question mm. <laughs> um the holy spirit versus materials for bibles bible study holy spirit versus materials for bible study i don't think that it has to be like either or mm. you know um the holy spirit definitely leads you to read um certain materials and certain you know books so i'll give a personal experience if that's why mm -hmm. you know um so i think around uh, i think i've shared this before um around 2018 2018 i wanted to go to a rabbinic school um and i really really did i took it very seriously like you know the way children grow up and say i know that i'm going to be a doctor mm -hmm. or i'm going to be a this like i've always i don't know why but i've always had this thing where I've just felt very compelled to like studies and research. Like I've just felt like in the body of Christ, <laughs> you know, like I feel like this is like one assignment that God has given to me. And, you know, I just really did feel like I really want to do whatever I need to do to um, just be on this path and just be where God wants me to be. Um, and then it started to become quite complicated anyways, but yeah. Um, by 20, 2018, you know, despite everything that, you know, I, I felt or I was, people were saying, um, I just really felt like I really want to see a body of Christ that is literate mm -hmm. in not just physically or mentally literate, but, you know, spiritually literate because spiritually illiteracy is a big thing. <laughs> it's a very big thing you know spiritual illiteracy is a big is a very big thing among believers you know um especially when people start to throw in like so many um texts out of context you know and then they use it as weapons to flog other people you yeah. know it's a it's an evidence of spiritual illiteracy mm -hmm. um you know and i for me i i really just felt like we have so many believers in the church but then we have very, 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 very few people that really understand the design of God. And so I felt like God was speaking about all of these things and the Holy Spirit was leading me to these things. And I was really at that point where I didn't know how to read. Like I was reading the Bible, but again, like I said, it felt like I was starting all over again. I didn't know how to read the Bible. So I used to read the Bible. I put my Bible in front of a fan. Okay, <laughs> and then wherever the breeze blows, literally. Oh my God! I thought it was only like, when, 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 when I first started reading the Bible, I thought be like, okay, it's time for Bible story. Man, you just see songs of the songs of Korah. Okay, I guess I read really Psalm forty-five today. Forget your father's house. The king is in love with you. The wrong Bible. I, I to like that was literally how I used to read that. I was kid you not. I used to put it in front of the fan and I was oh just like, God. wherever the breeze blows. So there was this thing <laughs> that really, the, the breeze and the Holy Spirit came in my favor. Mm -hmm. the, I, I found myself in the first Samuel um, chapter 3. And I think that that's one of my favorite. I have a lot of favorite scriptures. So please, in case Same. I say something, Same. I say that's one of my favorite scriptures. Like, please don't me. But yeah, like it's actually one of my favorite texts in scriptures, you know. 
where it says that um, at this time, in um, Elise's eyes were almost dim, the light in the candlestick, that is the menorah, was going dim, and the mm. word of God had become scarce yeah. in the land. I caught you know? that. Too. And then when he also said that, and then the Lord, um, and then at this time, the word of the Lord had not been revealed to Samuel. And so literally like in the text, oh my God, I feel so tempted to go there, but yeah. Um, but yeah, my focus was on the fact that he says, that he said that Samuel had not, and I felt like the Lord was just emphasizing on that. At this time, Samuel had not heard the word of the Lord for himself. Mm -hmm. And I just felt like that was so profound. I felt mm -hmm. like God was saying something to me. Mm -hmm. So I started asking the Lord questions like, okay, what does this mean? What are you saying to me? Like, I really want to, I really, really, really want to understand what you're saying. And then by the time I go back to the first part of the text, I'm reading about Ellie's eyes, the lights going off and the word being scarce. And oftentimes like blindness in scriptures often points to not just physical blindness, but spiritual blindness. Um, and then spiritual blindness is as a result of the absence of light, which is the menorah going dim. So the menorah, like in the book of Exodus, the Lord said to Moses that the lamb was not meant to go off at all because the light on the candlestick was supposed to be evidence or proof that the Lord's presence was there. Mm -hmm. And so the book of Samuel opening up or, you know, the story unfolding to the part that says that Eli, who was the priest, his eyes were dim. That is, he was not just physically blind, but he was also spiritually blind because his children were misbehaving already. Um, the light was going dim. It means that the presence of the Lord was slowly, like, you know, departing. And because his presence wasn't there, his word was scarce. So it wasn't even easy for people to hear what the Lord was saying. It was this. Ah, I really wish we honest, we we valued or we know the value of the times that we live in with so many people rising up as prophets and having an abundance of the word of God. It's such a gift. I, I really, really pray that we understand that it's such a gift. But then being in a time where the priest that is supposed to be the source is almost blind, the light that is supposed to be a reminder and a mark that the Lord is with you is going dim. And then the Lord's word being scarce. In the midst of that, he says that Samuel had not yet known the Lord or known the Lord's word for himself. Samuel was living in the, he wasn't living in the, he wasn't living with the priest. He was living in the tabernacle. Mm. And the tabernacle was supposed to, when you go back to Exodus, mm. the tabernacle was the most sacred place, mm. you know, in all of Israel. He was living in the tabernacle. He was supposed to be in the presence of God, but he did not know God. Mm. That's just insane. Like he didn't know God. He was literally in the holy place. The mm. holy place is not even the outer court. It's after the outer court. Then you have the holy place. And someone was staying there, but he did not know God. And he had not heard the word of God for himself. And that really got me thinking. And, you know, the Lord said to talk to me about the church. So I started having this heart that I really just want, you know, um, to be a literate believer. Mm. And I would like to see a body that is literate as well. You know, so I started asking God to please help me get into like a binary school. So I started praying about it. I did my research. I started looking out for schools that I wanted to apply to. And the reason I wanted to do that was because of this thing that I had in my heart. I knew that historically and even till today, one of the group of people or a group of people that the Lord has entrusted his word to is the, you know, the Jews, they go through scriptures, especially those that are either Orthodox or Messianic Jews. They study the word like it's their life. The way you would wake up and say, I'm going to work. They would wake up and go to like a library or go to like a biblical school to study. That's their life. Like, so they feel like the Lord has entrusted the word to them, you know, and these are the ones that are practicing and living out the principles, right? Not just those that are like from Israel, but like the ones that are practicing, the ones that are rabbis, it's like their lives are giving to the word completely. And so I really wanted to be like that. You know, I wanted like the whole, okay, you went to a school, you know, you are literate, you're educated and all of that stuff. And then 2020 came and there was a lockdown. And before the lockdown, the Lord said to lead me to like 
teachers um, that are written books like maybe like 100 years ago, people that had materials, there was, there was actually something that I was working on. And then I found a man that written like seven volumes. So imagine you feeling like you, you want to write a book and you say, oh, I finished writing this book. Mm -hmm. Then you now find somebody that has written seven volumes on just one sentence from what you wrote in the book. I felt so stupid. <laughs> I felt like, what? Like he had volume one, volume two, volume seven of the same topic. And I was like, what is going on? Just one text in scripture. Love the Lord with all your heart. Mm -hmm. The guy has seven volumes mm -hmm. on that, you know. And I don't think that I would have found that person except the Lord led me to him. You know, and then he started to lead me to other teachers and others, like this whole network of teachers, you know, um, people that had resources, people that there sometimes I'll find like resources online and then I'll try to go back there and I'll not find them again. Mm -hmm. You know, like just resources and materials and people that were willing to give themselves and pour themselves into me. Like I'll find myself in Zoom sessions that I don't even have any business with. Like then go, they speak their language. I'll just be like, this is nice, but I shall know that I came here for something and I need to go, you know, I need to leave with uh, something. And so one time I was having a conversation with uh, Sunesis. Mm -hmm. And Sunesis was saying that I feel like people just think that you your understanding of scriptures is because you read a lot. Mm -hmm. And I said, I read a lot, but the Holy Spirit leads me a lot. Like, mm -hmm. so there are some resources that I know I could have never in my lifetime found. If the Holy Spirit did not lead me to this, there are certain books that He would lead me to. He would yeah. literally say the name, yeah. and I would go online yeah, to same. look for them, you same. know, and I would find them, and I'll see that there are resources that they're written. So, like, there's oftentimes like this. Um, that experience actually, and that's that's actually really been my life, to be honest. Reverend used to like no good because 2020 there was lockdown. You know, I could not leave the country, and then um, the school that I was supposed to apply to at the point like. When they sent the bill to me, I was just like, Jesus. Well, I find it very, 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 very interesting because I didn't even know that you you had this story. I just mm -hmm. felt it in me to call you a rabbi. And I feel like that was prophetic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel like this is something that is still very much in your future, something mm -hmm. God is still going to do with you. Mm -hmm. So it's like, just keep that alive. Even as much as God is leading you to this people, you're reading these books. You are still going to go to school. Mm. I'm sure that's so strong. I'm actually like that's the the fellowship that we're in. Oh really? Yeah. yeah. So like this five of them, like five women, mm -hmm. the doctor in the school that I was trying to apply to in 2020 sent an email to me in 2021 April, mm -hmm. asking me that to join like a research team mm -hmm. that um, other rabbis were going to be a part of. Mm -hmm. So as far as I said, it was a scam. And then I, I said, man, I'm Why not going to <laughs> It just felt like it was too so good staff. to be true. Like, it just felt like it was too so good to be true. But then I joined, I, I sent, you know, my response, you know, sent my form, you know. And next thing, they, they sent me, like, a, you know, a document welcoming me to the fellowship. So I could have gone to the school, but now I'm in the school, but I'm not in the school as a student. Mm. I'm, with, I'm yeah, in the school under them being as a research. Disciple, yes, I mean, it's, I'm in the school. Funny enough, the thing is, I'm in the school doing a research. Mm -hmm. They are working on a document mm -hmm. on, the, on the woman and the cross. Yeah. I'm working on a document mm -hmm. by myself on priesthood and Melchizedek. Mm -hmm. And like these uh, materials that are going to be given to like a board of rabbis, mm -hmm. and then the board of rabbis are going to bet it, and then it's going to become a book. Man. So technically, I was supposed to go to the school as a student, mm -hmm. but I'm in the school, but I'm not a student. I'm yeah. just a researcher. If that makes That's sense. Man. You guys can see why Esther is here. This is like a rabbi. <laughs> Hello. Um, I know. I don't have. The, <laughs> I don't have it. But then, um, what's the word? Um, um, guys, let me just quickly say. Please, we do not want any arguments in the chat um, chat section. Um, deleted, whatever is your name. If you cannot be respectful, we would have to ask you to leave. We're not here to argue doctrine or make senseless arguments. We're here to discuss the Bible. If you cannot do that, please just leave. Like, you don't have to be here. Like, nobody's tying you to this session. If we are so offensive... Please just leave, like literally just leave. I will not tolerate disrespect and dishonor. 
please. Thank you very much. So I just want to ask everyone to please use the chat box to send in questions that they have. So please use the chat box to send in messages or questions you have for Esther and for me. So whilst we are waiting, hi El Shakar. <laughs> whilst we're waiting, I think I just want to read some of my favorite scriptures. So Esther, before you go on, what are your thoughts on Holy Spirit of research? I, I think I haven't gotten to the point of like, you know, research. Mm. yet i think i'm still at the point of being led by the holy spirit okay. for me i just believe that this is a lifelong journey mm -hmm. you know and i just feel like there's no need to rush myself i really mm -hmm. want to be grounded yeah. because i have been in a position where i rushed out before mm -hmm. and i saw what that did to me so i know that a lot of people are like greek latin hebrew i'm like we will get so, there but uh, <laughs> i'm not there I don't, I, don't, I don't want to know what ahab did for now you know that's just kind of where i am at so i just feel like yes of course it definitely has its place Mm -hmm. but I think like you know I'm not I'm not there yet so, so yeah. can I just just before we mm -hmm. just okay so like the the first thing is like on research um which is it's actually very necessary to ask the Holy Spirit to lead you to good resource materials um study materials because they can be very helpful mm -hmm. and one of the things that actually really helped was a conversation that i was having with our friend who is also a rabbi rabbi noah i like completely love him yeah. and one time we had like You're a spoken about him so a lot. <laughs> you know so we were having a conversation we we're supposed to have like a session and we spent about an hour catching up Mm -hmm. And then we spent like maybe an hour, 30 minutes in the, into the session. Mm -hmm. And then he was saying that this is actually one of the reasons, um, you know, having resource materials is necessary because resource materials helps you to be a part of the conversation from the beginning, mm -hmm. technically. So if you want to have a conversation with someone, mm -hmm. um, let's say three people having a conversation, you can't just walk in in the middle and then say, oh, yeah, yeah I really enjoyed this. I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need context. Mm -hmm. You need to understand, okay, where, how did this start, you mm -hmm. know? And I think sometimes when you go through, like, people's stories like Jabez, mm -hmm. it, it just came from nowhere. Jabez, right? Yeah, like Jabez, like his mother gave birth to him in sorrow, and then she named him Jabez because she, she bested him Which in sorrow. Which scripture is this? That's in First Chronicles. I don't think I've gotten there. <laughs> <laughs> and then Jabez, which is actually quite have maybe I, if I say the prayer, I, I remember the first all oh, that you would all oh, that you would enlarge my coast. I, I, I've heard people say it in church. Yes, that's the prayer. But of I can't remember like they call the it the prayer of Jabez. Right, yeah. Oh, that you would enlarge my coast. Yeah, and so Jabez was asking, that people, that. asking God to change his name. But the story is quite interesting because he just first says Jabez's mother. There was no, no like no, no nothing. Yeah. Jabez's mother gave birth to him. So named him Jabez. Yeah. And then it was and then Jabez would pray that and then brothers. that's just the end. That was the end. Like, like, why is this here? Absolutely. <laughs> Even the story of Job just came from nowhere. Job. Oh my <laughs> goodness. I have so many Job <laughs> scriptures to read. But I, I like actually read Job and finished reading Job and I was just crying. Mm. <laughs> so what was the reason? <laughs> <laughs> Are you going to tell us? You're not going to tell us? And like, that's actually something else that I'm like learning from like scripture. Like mm. many, well, Paul later tells us that many of the heroes of faith died without ever seeing him mm -hmm. and promise. But actually seeing it in real time. Now many people died without ever getting answers to their questions. I just mm. say, who am I? You're mere mortal. Mm. So now I expect that I will have answers to my questions. So like sometimes God is just like, yeah, when we see you, we'll talk mm. until then, just be all right. Basically. <laughs> So let's try and answer some of the Maybe questions. Okay. No, no, I'll, 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 I'll read after we answer a few questions. Will this slide be available later? I honestly don't know how this works, guys. I didn't know it was such like a technical thing. When I end it, I'll try and save it. But if you can't save, honestly, there's nothing I can do. What's the name of our guest? Instagram handle. Oh, her name is Esther Ide. Do you want to run it up for the people? Esther Ide. Yes, now. I D E H. I T now. Okay. Mm -hmm. Isn't it? You don't know my handle. I know your handle. Wait, you're not, you're not typing it. Okay. Am I not the one that just said that? It's um, Esther Ibe. Yeah, I just researched. So this is it. Esther on Instagram. You can find her there. 
Would you recommend reading different Bible translations? Absolutely. That's your best friend. Yeah. <laughs> translations are like your best friends. I like to describe translations in like three ways. So there is translation. There is the first on the spectrum of translations. The first one is the, if you think of the suit, the guy in his suit and tie, mm. what, what translation do you call it? NKJV. NKJV. So you think <laughs> of that's actually on I feel like, like, I feel like, <laughs> The different Bible trans translations like one is English, one is PG, one is Hebrew, <laughs> one is Igbo. So it's like it's just like different men coming together. I, I however have a problem with message version. I'm just mm. going to say that. Like I, I don't read message version. It makes me very uncomfortable. Mm. And I just don't read the message version because I feel like there are certain things that have been removed and Absolutely. things that have been added. So I don't read message version. My mm. favorite Bible translation is NLT. Like NLT still falls under the same category that message translation. Are you serious? Yes. I like NLT. It's because like the NKJV, which is like the formal translation, they try to be very close to like original language mm -hmm. as possible. So they come off as very in very formal. Mm -hmm. Then you have the ones um that are informal. Informal is the one that like um, passion. Passion NLT is and that what I'm saying that yes, passion, passion NLT. I'm not a big fan of passion, message. Yeah. I don't like, I don't believe in I don't read passion, but I don't know. I don't know that some um, people like it. <laughs> but there's passion translation, there's message, there's NLT. Um, you have good news translation as well, which is informal. And then you have the ones that are in the middle. Those ones are um, amplified. Amplified translation is in the middle. So if you want to use your translations, I would advise that you take at least one translation from each of these categories. So you can either use NKJV or you can use um, NLT or you can use Amplified. So maybe you can use one of the three. It will really, really help you um, in Bible study. It's like just hearing one story, but then you're hearing it from three different narrators. It helps you to see the... So the somebody picture. is saying, in what order should Christians, especially beginners, read the Bible? Um, this person is saying she rushed through the Bible and nothing entered her head. Mm. Um, like, basically, I just feel like for me, I've heard a lot of people say, oh, start in the New New um, Testament, that when you read the New Testament, then you understand the Old Testament. Mm. I don't know. I tried that. It didn't work for me. So I started in Genesis, and it has been beautiful. I'm now starting to, to like <laughs> sort of follow the story of creation. Even though the Bible was not written in chrono chronological order, it's not like that's how the order of like mm. the world happened. But I just find more comfort just reading it that way. Mm. So that's what I did. Mm. I don't know, Esther, what do you have to say? I would say Genesis. Like yeah. Genesis, like read from the beginning. You don't open a novel when you're reading Mills and Bones. That's if you're reading. You don't open the middle. And Esther, how old are you? Say Mills and Bones. <laughs> I don't know. I never read those books. But I, but I mean, I I'm know serious. that it was very popular. You must have heard that from I mean, no, so many From times. your mom. Not from yeah. anybody. Not my mom. Are you kidding me? I'm 30. So, uh -uh. I feel I like even like in high school, school your mom, mom, my mom. Even when we read it now, like they had it in the house. So oh. yeah, so you don't yeah. like you don't read a good novel and then just open the middle, you know, and say, oh, okay, let me start from here. Like after all, it's still going to make sense. Mm -hmm. It might help. It might work because, like I said, like I said at the beginning, the Bible is like you know. Um, hyperlinked, everything mm. links you or everything relates to everything. Do you get what I'm saying? Mm. But then when you go to the book of Revelation, you now start to realize that you can't just open the Bible and read and things will just enter your head. There are so many things that are written in the book of Revelations that will take you back to the book of Genesis. Like yeah. you have no choice. You have to go back to Genesis yeah. and you have to go back to Exodus. You have to read all of these things. So I would more likely you advise people to start from Genesis, but on the other hand, which still goes back to it, ask the Lord to lead you. And yeah, ask you that's, where you that's the to best. Start. So, that's the best. you know, if you're looking for the other Genesis, but then if you want the Lord to lead you, you know. Um, someone said, um, would you recommend any resource materials for someone who wants to study the Bible? I would say um, this is one of the things that really helps BibleHub.com is like your friend. Biblehub.com is like your friend. Um, please do biblehub.com. You can also check out studylight.org. I know that there are so many other apps that have come out, but then I'm not so sure about this, these platforms. So I would advise biblehub.com, studylight.org, 
Bible, I'm sorry, um, Bible project is your best friend, um, especially when you want to start like book study. Um, Bible project has this thing where they will help you um, just give you an overview of the book, you know, before you go in so that you know what to embark on. Someone so, said, Esther, you countered something people said. Not everything written in the Bible is the word of God. That's not what Esther said. And the person goes on to ask, but when Apostle Paul said we may come, well, what or when Apostle Paul said we may come, preach? please clarify this for me. I started to say that not everything written in the Bible is the word of God. Please listen to all, <laughs> understand. I think I said that people say that not everything in the Bible is the word of God, but that's not true. That's what I said. And I said, if anybody has to say something like that, it would help for you to understand or have a contextual knowledge of what the Bible is. So the Bible is the word. The Bible is, is it contains words that have been written of God, from God, about God, and by God, right? Um, so yeah, I hope that clarifies. But then um, when Paul said, women can't preach, Please clarify this for me. I think this is based upon what the whether I don't know if it was a man or a woman that was talking about women preaching. Um, this is what we're saying about context. Mm -hmm. um, context is very important in your understanding of Bible studies. Um, you need to remember that conversations don't just happen. When Paul is writing a letter to a church, it is based on the feedback and issues that's in that church. Right. So when he was speaking about women not teaching in the church, I want us to remember that he was speaking to a community that was first Greek. So they were mostly Gentiles. They were people that had like um, a culture and a way that was not in alignment with what God designed for his body. And then at the time, a lot of the women or a lot of people in the church were not necessarily um, um they didn't have like knowledge of scriptures. They didn't have like a lot of knowledge of these things. And then it's the same thing that James said, not all of us should go on to become teachers. That was not an attack on women or men. It was an attack. It wasn't even an attack. It was an advice that was given to believers. If you don't understand something, then maybe you should take time understanding it first before you speak about it. And so in that context, the women at the time did not have understanding as much as some of the teachers in the community had, number one. And then number two, the culture at the time was um, would have been an impediment. It would have been a, you know, it would have been a hindrance in the building of the body of Christ in that particular community. So Paul was not attacking women. In fact, it's the same Paul that says in his letters, that in Christ there is neither male nor female, there is neither Greek nor Jews. So when we want to reference things that Paul said, um, it's necessary that we don't pick and choose. That we look do at it in it. context. Look at it, you know. And even when we look through Scripture, we see so many women that God did absolutely use in the, in the forefront. Absolutely. Deborah, like there's so many women. So Anna. God is not anti-women. Yeah. Anna, who was a you know prophetess who yeah. came up and held Jesus yeah. and prophesied you know, with his parents yeah. and, you know, she had been in the temple for, for all her life. For like so years and years. So actually. God is not anti-women speaking. And besides, if women should stop speaking, it's like, where where are the men? <laughs> <laughs> should yeah, nobody yeah. preach the gospel? <laughs> <laughs> or if there's a fire burning in you, you pour water on it <laughs> because you don't want to offend toxic men. <laughs> but yeah, somebody said that, uh, did you pray in tongue for long before you felt the Holy Spirit? I didn't. I didn't pray in tongues at all because I couldn't pray in tongues at that time. I didn't have the gift. But when the Holy Spirit came, it was the first time I prayed in tongues. I don't know how long I was there. I just know that it was the sincerity of my prayer. I just wanted to be friends. So, Okay, somebody else is asking um, something along the lines of how like, when she reads scripture, she might see things that contradict mm. with her um, idea of God. Okay, so let me just quickly say that you are not reading scripture to see if it aligns with your beliefs. Scripture is reading you to mm. see if you align with God's thought processes and the way he has said we should live in this world. Mm. So immediately I come into scripture and I see something that I know is telling me that I have 
I have interpreted God wrongly. I have to adjust my my own belief mm. system, um, system mm. and not say, how can I get this scripture to fit into my belief system? It's when we do that that we now run into error, when we start saying things like, we mess up in preachers. <laughs> and things like that. I don't even want to get into that because it's very messy. But yeah, basically, I feel like there are like deeper issues than women <laughs> in the world and in the body of Christ and women that are preaching who are literally doing nothing except winning souls. I don't know why that's such a problem, but for some people it's a problem. But yeah, basically, when we come into scripture and we see things, this is even a very strong point for me because I, I grew up in a Christian home, mm-hmm. quote. <laughs> so obviously there are stories you've heard about God. Mm. So when you come to read scripture, there's a tendency to read scripture through those things you've heard. For yeah. instance, you 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 know that Adam and Eve ate an apple, but it's never stated in, in the script in scripture that they ate apple. So when you come to read the Bible, if you don't throw away everything you know, you, don't throw away you will apple. just read apple without fling <laughs> the apple away. <laughs> you will just read. If it's apple and gave it to her husband, it was never apple, please. Like so that's just like a like a minor like example yeah. of like things that people come into scripture Biases, with, yeah. and you have to like abandon those things, you know, yeah. uh, to be able to really hear God. Okay, somebody is asking something about women putting up um trousers mm-hmm. or wearing clothes that have to pertain to men. Okay, so I see what's happening now. And it's a good thing. So, like, our ideologies are coming. They are bubbling to the surface. And that's good. That's Mm -hmm. what happens every time you come to the world. Mm -hmm. Um, What is most important is the heart of God and his mind. That's, I think, I don't think that that can be overemphasized. And then also, there are certain things that um, we even if we need to understand about God's idea when he he maps out his plans for mankind, right? Um, one of the things, and which is the most important thing, is that we you go back to what um, Paul was speaking about in one of his episodes. Um, if the things that you're going to do is going to cause your brother to fall, then it is preferable for you to avoid those things, right? And when you read that text very closely, you see that the heart of what he's saying is rooted in love, genuine love that is for service to those that are around you. Um, So the question I would ask is, um, is this thing that you're talking about, oh, women wearing this or men wearing that? And sometimes I just kind of feel like the way we portray the Bible, we tend to use it as a weapon against women. So it's like, oh, um, women should not do this. I, I hardly actually hear like men should not do this or men should do that. But then the Bible is so balanced because it addresses both the male and the female. So on one hand, I really just want to deal with that bias that it is not a tool to you know, tailor what women should 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 or shouldn't be about, if that makes sense. But it is a book that is tailored to guide all of believers, that is the body of Christ, into what the Lord desires that his body would be like. Now, so this thing where we speak about people wearing trousers, people wearing jewelry, people using makeup, people doing all of that stuff, I would say everything should be done in moderation. That's what I would say. Do everything in moderation. It doesn't have to be out of Don't blow it out of proportion. Don't do it with the intentions of seduction. Don't do it with the intention. And this is both male and female because male also have the capacity or capability to seduce women as well. You know, the same way women have the ability or capacity to do the same to to women and to men as well. So I would say like everything should be done in moderation as scripture has advised us to. Before you put on anything or before you call out yourself, you have to ask yourself, is this thing going to cause somebody to fall? Is this going to even make somebody question my faith? You know, is this going to make somebody um, worried about their salvation? Like, you know, you're going to walk into a place and somebody mm-hmm. just going to be like, oh my God, like, you know I what? I feel like know? everything is about balance, especially when it comes to dressing and modesty. Yeah. Right, I feel like there are people who always want to like police women on what they should wear and what mm. they shouldn't wear. I'm sorry, but I am not responsible for the lust in a man's heart mm. because there are some people that even if you wear the longest dress, they'll be like, I wonder what's underneath that dress. <laughs> like it could be the most mm. random thing, you know. 
I believe in balance. I believe that as women, uh, we should place value on our bodies. Mm. We shouldn't also just let any random Tom, Dick and Harry see your entire body. Like that's yeah, the absolutely. you know, dress modestly, dress in a way that honors God, dress in a way that honors your own body, dress in a way that honors, if you're married, your um, spouse, you know, as well. But then there are people who just believe that women should wear shapeless clothes because men are struggling with lust. I, I'm just like, yeah. you know, no, <laughs> no. I think everything should be done in moderation. Yeah, and I also think that everything should be done in respect to what the Lord asks you to do. There are some people that God will actually say, you know, I don't want you to do certain things, and you don't do them. The Lord can say, oh, don't wear this. You know, it's very possible for the Lord to actually speak about that. Okay, know? so the um, the sorry to cut you short. The, the comment, I mean, the chat is getting a bit messy. I feel like people are now using us to ask questions. So like. Um, in, in as much as we want to ask questions, there are some things that we want to encourage you to go and study on, right? It's not like, oh, Esther, tell me what you think about this. Isn't it? What does this mean? Like, go and study those things. Like, these questions you're asking, have you actively searched for an answer? Have you searched scripture? Have you read books? Have you watched videos on it? I always tell people, don't ask me what my opinion or my thoughts is. It's not that I don't want to share it or that I don't have one, but that at the end of the day, what God says takes paramount or takes like you know precedence over anything. And we, I know Esther and I, mm. are trying to raise a people who can stand on their own. We're not trying to raise people who will be clinging to us or mm. messaging us every five minutes. That's not the idea. So from the things that have been shared today, please take the time to do your own research. YouTube is vast with resources and videos on every single subject that you need that is godly. If you pray to God to guide you on you know, where to check. God will guide you. There are thousands of books. People are always telling me, recommend books. Just type it on Google. You will see books. You know, like, just take that extra step to do your own personal research and get answers mm. for the questions that you have. So those are all the questions that we are basically going to take for this session. Um, and before we close, I just want to read a few of my favorites scriptures from how I have been, from all the things that I have been reading. This one is from Genesis chapter 26, verse 12. It says, when Isaac planted his crops that year, he harvested a hundred times more grain than he planted for the Lord blessed him. Now, when I read that scripture, I just realized like, oh my goodness, that other scripture just came to my mind. It's not about him that run it on him, that mm. led by God that showed mercy. I was immediately like, oh my goodness. So somebody can plant something and then reap 100 times more than what he planted simply because god has blessed them immediately in my mind it's like okay i can do something and god can so bless that thing that the result is 100 times more than what it should ordinarily be already my mindset is changing mm. so this is how reading scripture helps me walk with god even when I post content to my YouTube channel, I say this all the time, I pray before any of my videos go out. And that prayer is always God. I remember one time, somebody sent me a very silly message telling me that I was now doing videos so that people will watch them. That is why I do videos, so that people will watch them. I'm not doing it so that only you will watch my videos, so that only 10 people will watch it. The idea is for it to reach like a million people, 10 million people, 100 million people. <laughs> so when, I'm, when I do my videos, I understand that God can bless my efforts because it's a lot of effort to create one video. Mm -hmm. God can bless that effort and triple it so that the reward from it, like the number of people who watch it, I lot. I feel like, yes, what I did had an impact. Look at all these people. Look at how many views. I'm so grateful to God. And that is something that happens almost every single time. Mm -hmm. Because I read the scripture and I understood that, okay, if I plant something, if I create something, God can bring like a hundredfold if he blesses me. Mm -hmm. And so now understanding that I'm doing my own part of recording the video and editing it, making sure it has a certain quality. By the end of the day, God is the one who is going to bring that harvest, who is going to make it go far, who is going to bring the people that are going to watch it. And so with that consciousness, I always see an increase. It's not like I'm chasing an increase, but I understand that this is necessary for the advancement of what I'm even doing. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. Esther, do you have any scripture you want to share? Um, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah, okay, let me just share one more. And then I think we'll pray. 
And then I have like 10, but I feel like we've already talked so much. So I just want to just read one more and then we would end it. So this is from De Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 22. It says, be careful to obey all these commands I am giving you. Show love to the Lord your God by walking in his ways and holding tightly to him. So God is saying, if you want to show me that you love me, obey me, walk in my ways and hold tightly to me. And so I just immediately know that I could say a thousand and one times I love God. It means nothing if I don't obey him and follow him and work closely with him. It's like, <laughs> that's how God reads love. For me, I read love through now acts of service because of my husband. That's why it used to be. But like when I see the things that my husband does to show me that he loves me, I feel loved. So the same way God, when he sees us making that effort to obey him, to walk with him, to be close to him, holding on tightly to him, he knows that we love him. Mm -hmm. And I feel like it just, just shows like the tenderness of God that he wants to be held. Mm -hmm. He wants us to come close. And for him, it's like, oh, this is when I know that you love me, when you are not afraid to come close. You know? So yeah, so these are these are some of the ways that scripture is like trans transforming my mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, basically. So yeah, um, Esther, you want to pray? <laughs> oh, okay. So we can end. Yeah. All right. So Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Um, thank you for every single person that um, you have brought here. We thank you, Lord, because um, where our human capacity ends, that's where you begin. And so I we just pray that for everyone that seeks understanding, you give. Um, pray that the heart of the people be ignited, Lord, to just desire you, to sit down with you, to fellowship with you, not for what they might gain from you, but because they want to love you and they want to know you. We ask, Father, that you would open our eyes to see the wonders of your word. Um, even as it says that your word is um, like a spring that refreshes our souls. We ask, Father, that our souls will be refreshed. Our eyes will be open to see our ears will be open to hear and our hearts will be open to receive from you in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We pray that for everyone that has questions today, Holy Spirit, we just pray that you will be teacher. Uh, you will be teacher, Lord, uh, that you will lead them to the streams where they can drink from. And I just ask that you open their eyes to see when you're leading them to these places in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. We pray that even as your body Father, you would cause us to grow into the body that you desire that we become. Mm -hmm. um, as you said, that you're giving gifts to your church for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, so that together we would grow into the full stature of Christ. We pray, Father, that this would be our desire and this would be our reality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, guys, for sticking around. One hour, 30 minutes. We honor your time. Jesus honors your time. Thank you so much. Um, it's still Esther Ide. If you want to reach her and if you want to join her Bible study, you know, community, I will try and find a way to save this life. If I can't save it, I'm really sorry. I'm really, really sorry. I'm sorry. But yeah, um, thank you, guys. Um, and bye. Bye. Thank you.